This video series is to accompany the Cisco NetAcad Switching, Routing, and Wireless Essentials course. This video covers Module 12, Wireless LAN Concepts. In this video, we're going to look at seven objectives, Introduction to Wireless, Components of the WLAN, WLAN Operation, CAP WAP Operation, Channel Management, WLAN Threats, and Securing WLANs. 12.1 Introduction to Wireless. There's a benefit to having wireless local area networks. It's a type of wireless network that's commonly used in homes, offices, and campus environments. WLANs make mobility possible within the home and business environment, and the infrastructures adapt to ra rapidly changing needs and technologies. You don't have to have a wire to your device, and therefore you can be mobile, move around, and it makes for a much more productive environment. Now there's different types of wireless networks. You have a wireless personal area network or a WPAN. That has low power. It's short range. It's about 20 to 30 feet. It's based on the IEEE 802.15 standard and the 2.4 gigahertz frequency. Bluetooth and Zigbee are wireless PAN or we just call them PAN, personal area networks. You also have the wireless LAN. That's a medium-sized network. You get a range of about 300 feet, and it's based on the 802.11 standard from IEEE, and it's either the 2.4 or the 5 gigahertz frequency. And then you have a wireless MAN, or metropolitan area network. That's a large geographic area, like a city or a district area. It uses licensed frequencies. And then you have a wireless WAN, or wireless area network. That's an extensive geographic area for national or global communication. It uses specific license frequencies as well. Bluetooth is the IEEE WPAN standard used for device pairing up to about 300 feet distance. Bluetooth Low Energy, or BLE, supports mesh topology to scale large network devices. And then you have Bluetooth Basic Rate or Enhanced Rate or BR EDR. That supports point-to-point -point topologies and it's optimized for audio streaming. And you also have WiMAX. That's Worldwide Interoperability for Microwave Access. That's an alternative broadband wired internet connections and that falls underneath the IEEE 802.16 WLAN standard for up to 30 miles. Most of us are familiar with cell broadband, and I'm just going to say cell because I have a lot of trouble saying cellular, so I'm just going to say cell broadband. It carries both voice, voice and data. It's used by phones, automobiles, tablets, and laptops. You have a global system of mobile, or GSM, that's internationally recognized, and you also have the Code Division Multiple Access, or CDMA, and that's primarily used in the United States. We also have satellite broadband that uses directional satellites dish, dishes aligned with satellites in geostationary orbit and they need clear line of sight and those are typically used in rural areas where cable and DSL are unavailable. If we look at the chart here on this screen, 802.11 WLAN standards define how radio frequencies are used for wireless links. You have the 802.11 which is the 2.4 gigahertz that gives you data rates up to 2 megabytes. The 11A was the 5 gigahertz range that gave you up to five or 54 megabytes. It is not interchangeable or interoperable with 802.11b or 11g. And then you had 11b came along. That was 2.4 gigahertz range that got it up to 11 megabytes. But the longer range, um, longer range than 802.11, and better, and it was better able to penetrate building structures. And then you got, and then when they came along with the 11g, that was in the 2.4 gigahertz range. The data rates were up to 50 more, 54 megabits, and it was backwards compatible with the B version. And then they came along with the 11N, and we have 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. You got data rates from anywhere from 150 up to 600 megabits, and it requires multiple antennas with MIMO technology. And then AC came along in the 5 gigahertz range. That gave us data rates of 450 up to 1.3 gigabits a second, and that supports up to 8 antennas. And now we have the 802.11ax, that's also in the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz range, and that uses high efficiency wireless, and it's capable of using 1 gigahertz and 7 gigahertz frequencies. Now all wireless devices operate in the range of electromagnetic spectrum, and WLAN networks operate in the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz frequency bands. 
Um, that's the UHF and 5 gigahertz is the SHF. And if we look at this chart here of this nice little uh, graphic, we show that radio waves uh, are on a longer signal. And as we get up closer to the gamma ray area or X-rays, those signals tighten up and get closer and closer together. So the sun and light is in the ultraviolet band here. Infrared is here. And down here we do our radio waves. And this is where wireless devices operate down in this range here. Now, as we studied in previous classes and modules, standards ensure interoperability between devices. And the way I like to explain this to my students is if I'm speaking English and someone else I'm trying to communicate with is speaking French, um, we need to come to a common language that we can both speak. So if we both speak Spanish, we can have a standardized language that we can both speak in. So the French speaking person can also speak Spanish I'm an English speaking person and can speak Spanish. We can both speak in Spanish and therefore we set a standard. And that's what happens with technology. We need to set a standard in place so that devices can communicate properly. So that interoperability between devices and manufacturers um, is set by international organizations. And three of those are the International Telecommunications Union or ITU. And that regulates the allocation of the radio spectrum and satellite orbits. You have the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, commonly known as IEEE. They specify how a radio frequency is modulated to carry information. They maintain the standards for local and metropolitan area networks, and that falls underneath the IEEE 802 land man family of standards. And then you have the Wi-Fi Alliance. That promotes the growth and acceptance acceptance of wireless lands and it's an association of vendors whose objective is to improve the interoperability of products that are based on the 802.11 standard. 12.2 wireless LAN components. Now to communicate wirelessly laptops, tablets, smartphones, and other devices, um, even automobiles, include integrated wireless NICs that incorporate a radio transmitter and receiver and yes most new vehicles, in fact I think all new vehicles, have some type of cellular um, device inside them so that they can communicate with the manufacturer or communicate. Um, and that most commonly um, you'll see OnStar, I'm, just, and I'm, not, I'm not saying they're better than anybody else, but that's a common one um, that uses a cellular radio embedded in the vehicle to communicate um, through wireless um, towers to give information. So if a device does not have an integrated wireless NIC though, a USB wireless adapter can be used and put into the device. We have wireless home routers. A home will typically interconnect wireless devices using a small wireless router. Uh, wi wireless routers serve as the following as an access point. They provide, wires, um, they provide wired access. So you can plug in on the back and have wired access. And that's a uh, misprint there. Um, you, they act as switches. They can interconnect wired devices. And they also act as a router. They can provide a default gateway to other networks and to the internet. Now the wireless access point or a WAP is a wireless clients use their wireless NIC to discover nearby access points and clients then attempt to associate and authenticate with an access point and then after being authenticated wireless users have access to whatever network resources are available. Now access points can be categorized as either autonomous or controller based. Autonomous means it's a standalone device configured through a command line or GUI each autonomous AP acts independently of others, and it's configured and managed manually by an administrator. Um, for years in my personal home, I used autonomous AP. I usually had a couple of them set up in my house. And recently, I went to uh, what we call controller-based or mesh, and that's known as lightweight APs. So we use a lightweight access point protocol to communicate with other lightweight WAN controllers, and each LAP is automatically configured and managed by the wireless um, controller. And so you can have one that controls the other devices. And that's uh, what I'm doing in my personal home now is I'm doing mesh networking so that I can just set up one device and then it, can, it talks to the other ones and I don't have to have multiple access points. Now there's different types of external antennas. You have omnidirectional that provides a 360 degree coverage. It's ideal for homes and home offices. You have directional. That's the focus, the radio signal. that focuses the radio signal in a specific direction and you might have a Yagi or a parabolic dish, and I may be pronouncing that wrong, I don't know. I'm just saying it looks like Yagi. Then you have multiple input, multiple output, or MIMO, which we mentioned earlier. That uses multiple antennas up to eight to increase the bandwidth, and that would be an example here.
12.3 Wireless LAN Operation With wireless topology mode, you have ad hoc mode. That's used to connect clients in a peer-to-peer -peer manner. So if I had two mobile devices, I would just connect those together. Um, that would, An example of that would also be if you had a smartwatch or a smart device connected to your cell phone or your smartphone, that would be an ad hoc mode. Then you have infrastructure mode. That's used to connect clients to the network using an access point. Then you have tethering. That's a variation of the ad hoc topology. It's when a smartphone or a tablet with cell data it has access enabled to create a personal hotspot. So you'll set your smartphone up to be a um, to broadcast out so it will use its connection to the internet to then allow other devices to connect to it and that's considered tethering or a hotspot. Infrastructure mode defines two topology blocks. You have basic service set or BSS that uses a single access point to interconnect all associated wireless clients and clients in different BSSs cannot communicate together. And then you have extended service set or ESS. That's a union of two or more BSSs interconnected and clients in each BSS can communicate through the ESS or extended service set. Here we have an example of an 802.11 frame structure. Uh, its format is similar to Ethernet frame formats, except that it contains more fields. Wireless LANs are half duplex and a client cannot hear while it is sending, making it impossible to, de to detect collisions. So wireless LANs use a carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance, or CSMA slash CA, to determine how and when to send their data. A wireless client does the following. First, it listens to the channel to see if it's idled, and then if no other traffic is currently on the channel, then it sends a ready signal or an RTS message to the access point to request dedicated access. If it receives a clear to send or CTS message from the AP, it's then granted access to send. It waits a random amount of time before restarting the process if no CTS message is received. And then if it does connect, it transmits the data and then acknowledges all transmissions. If a wireless client does not receive an acknowledgement, it assumes a collision occurred and it restarts the process. For wireless devices to communicate over a network, they must first associate with an access point or a wireless router. Wireless devices complete the following three-stage process. They discover an access point, they authenticate with the access point, and then they associate with the access point. But then to achieve successful association, a wireless client and an access point must agree on specific parameters. Again, we're coming back to the format. They have to talk the same language. So they need to set the SSID. The client needs to know the name of the network to connect. It needs a password if that's been set up. That's required for the client to authenticate to the access point. The network mode, the 802.11 standard in use, the security mode, and the channel settings. Wireless clients connect to the access point using a passive or active scanning probing process. The passive mode, the AP openly advertises its service by periodically sending broadcast beacon frames containing the SSID. Its supported standards and security settings get broadcast out. The active mode, wireless clients must know the name of the SSID. The wireless client initiates the process by broadcasting a probe, uh, a probe request frame on multiple channels. 12.4 CAP WAP Operation. CAP WAP is an IEEE standard protocol that enables a wireless or WLC to manage multiple APs and wireless LANs. It's based on the LWAPP, but it adds additional security with Datagram Transport Layer Security or DLTS. It encapsulates and forwards WLAN client traffic between an AP and a WLC over tunnels using the UDP port 5246 and 5247. And it operates over IPv4 and IPv6. V4 uses IP protocol 17 and V6 uses protocol 136. The CAPWAP split MAC concept does all the functions normally performed by individual APs and then it distributes them between two functional components, the AP MAC functions or the WLC MAC functions. And you can see the chart here and for each one of those. The detail DTLS encryption provides security between the AP and the WLC. It's enabled by default to secure the CAPWAP control channel and encrypt all management and control traffic between the AP and the WLC. And the data encryption is disabled by default and requires a DTLS license to be installed on the WLC before it can be enabled on the AP. 
Now, Flex Connect enables the configuration and control of APS over a, w, uh, over a wireless um, area network link. There's two modes of operation options, or two modes, and it should say operations here for the Flex Connect AP. You have connected mode. The WLC is reachable. The Flex Connect AP has CapWAP connectivity, and then the WLC performs all CapWAP functions. And then we have standalone mode. The WLC is unreachable. The Flex Connect AP has lost CapWAP connectivity, and the Flex Connect AP can assume some of the functions, such as switching client data traffic locally and performing client authentication locally. 12.5 Channel Management If the demand for a specific wireless channel is too high, the channel may become oversaturated and it degrades the quality of the communication. So channel saturation can be mitigated by using techniques that, techniques that use channels more efficiently, you can use Direct Sequence Spread Spectrum, or DSSS. It's a modulation technique designed to spread a signal over a large frequency band. It's used by 802.11b devices to avoid, to avoid interference from other devices. You can also have Frequency Hopping Spread Spectrum, or FHSS. This transmits radio sequence signals by rapidly switching a carrier signal among different frequencies, or frequency channels. The sender and receiver must synchronize or be synchronized to know which channel to jump to, and it's used by the original 80211 standard. And then you have orthogonal, if I'm saying that absolutely correct, I'm trying to get that, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, or OFDM. It's a subset of frequency division multiplexing in which a single channel uses a multiple subchannels on adjacent frequencies. And the OFDM is used by a number of communication systems, including 802.11, A, G, N, and then AC. Now, depending on how you're setting up, the 2.4 gigahertz band is subdivided into multiple channels, each allocated 22 megahertz bandwidth, and it's separated from the next channel by 5 megahertz. So best practice for 802.11, B, G, N, N is to require multiple APs to have non-overlapping channels, such as 1, 6, and 11, so you would have 1, 6, and 11. So if you have three access points and they're both on the 2.4 gigahertz band, you want to make sure that you set one at one channel, one at 6, and one 11. Or if you're going to have more than three, you're going to look at their distances and make sure that they're placed say, um, far enough apart and make sure that their channels don't overlap. For the 5 gigahertz standard, there's 24 channels, and each channel is separated from the next channel by 20 megahertz. So there's non-overlapping channels um, at 36, 48, and 60. Now the number of users supported by WLAN depends on the following. The geographic layout of the facility, and we're looking at a facility on the right-hand side here. The number of bodies and devices that can fit into a space. The data rates the users are expecting. And the use of non-overlapping channels by multiple APs and transmitting power settings, or transmit power settings. So in planning the location of APs, the approximate circular coverage area is important and if you're using packet tracer they do a really good job there of showing like a little purple circular layout and that's also going to be impacted though by walls and obstructions so you also want to keep that in mind so if i had a concrete wall right here let's just i'm going to give an example like here let's say i had a concrete wall right there this circle may not extend out as far there it may actually only go to like this right here so you want to keep that in mind, too, when you're looking at a layout, that it's not just, hey, I'm going to get full coverage. I'm also looking at obstructions when I'm looking at that um, AP circle. 12.6, wireless LAN threats. So a wireless LAN is open to anyone within range of the AP and the appropriate credentials to associate to it. So attacks can be generated by outsiders fairly easily. In fact, much easier than you can on an Ethernet because you have to have a port jack to plug into to attack a Ethernet um, network. But on wireless, you're broadcasting your information out. So any anything uh, from a disgruntled employee, unintentional by employees connecting, they may have uh, malware on a device and they connect with their bring their own device. Wireless networks are specifically susceptible to several threats, including interception of data, wireless intruders, denial of service, and rogue APs. And I'll give you an example of a denial of service way back when I first, um, wireless was still back, and I think this was either A or B service, but I had my students in a classroom, and we all turned our wireless uh, devices on, that we, we all had laptops on, and we just started sending massive amounts of data to uh, one particular point 
and all of a sudden you could just see, I mean, not all of a sudden, but after all that data started getting pushed through the wireless, you could see a degradation of, of, of uh, speed on all of our devices. And so it's a really good way to see um, how easy it is to do a denial of service if you get enough devices pushing a lot of data through one access point. And that's with the denial of service attacks. Um, they can be improperly configured devices. A malicious user could be intentionally interfering with the wireless communication, either by putting some type of um, broadcast out that's interfering with the, uh, with the same band, with the same megahertz, or just pushing a lot of data through. And then you can also have accidental interference. Let's some, say somebody brings a, uh, a device in that's broadcasting in the 2.4 gigahertz range, uh, a radio, for example, uh, a handheld radio, and it's sending out a lot of uh, signal and it's, it's interfering with your uh, wireless access point. So to minimize the risk of a DOS attack uh, due to improperly configured devices and malicious attacks, you want to harden all your devices. You want to keep your passwords secure, create backups, and then ensure all configuration changes are incorporated during off hours. Now, a rogue AP is an AP or wireless router that's been connected to a corporate network without authorization and against corporate policy. And it's fairly easy to do this, by the way. If you have access to an Ethernet jack, it's fairly easy to bring a home router or a router and plug it in and start broadcasting wireless. Once connected, the rogue AP can be used by an attacker to capture MAC addresses, capture data packets, gain access to network resources, or launch a man-in-the-middle attack. And then you can have personal network hotspots can also be used as a rogue AP. So, for example, a user with secure network access enables their authorized Windows host to become a Wi-Fi access point. And to prevent the installation of rogue APs, organizations must configure WLCs with rogue AP policies and use monitoring software to actively monitor the radio spectrum for unauthorized APs. Another thing that I, um, that I teach students about, and you should be aware about too, is, is teaching your customers or teaching your clients about um, free Wi-Fi or public Wi-Fi because that's really susceptible to rogue access points. So for example, if you pull up to your favorite um, restaurant or your coffee bar and they offer free Wi-Fi and someone wants to open up their laptop and do some banking, well, they need to be very mindful that there could be a rogue access point. Not only could the coffee bar be sniffing their traffic and looking at it, but there could be a rogue access point that sets themselves up to look exactly like the, the coffee bar. And then you could connect to that and then to the internet, and they could be also sniffing all your traffic. So you want to be very careful that you're, that you're teaching clients about using VPNs and using other methods when they're connecting to uh, access points. Now, a man-in-the-middle attack, the hacker is positioned in between two legitimate entities in order to read or modify the data that passes between the two parties. A popular wireless man-in-the-middle attack is called the Evil Twin AP attack. That's where attacker introduces a rogue AP and configures it with the same SSID as a legitimate AP, and that's what I just mentioned. Those are very popular and they're easy to set up. So to defeat one of those MITM, or man-in-the-middle attacks, it begins with identifying legitimate devices on the wireless LAN, and then to do that, users must be authenticated. So after all the legitimate devices are known, the network can then be monitored for abnormal devices or traffic. 12.7, securing wireless LANs. Now, one step that you can do is SSID cloaking. Um, APs in some wireless routers do allow the SSID bacon frame, bacon, um, I'm, I'm thinking about bacon, um, the SSID beacon frame to be disabled. Wireless clients must be manually configured with the SSID to connect to the network then, so you have to know the SSID. Now, this is um, kind of a security through obscurity, and you'll hear that term, security through obscurity. It, 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 your average user is not going to be able to see that SSID. But for example, like on my smartphone, I have an app that will scan wireless um, access points and it will show me even the hidden SSIDs and it will show me the connect in, connecting information. So even though you hide your SSID, it still is or can be found by someone that is determined enough. So that's a, a, a security through obscurity. But you can also do MAC address filtering. An administrator can manually permit or deny clients wireless access based on their physical MAC address hardware. And in the and and it says in the figure, but we don't have a figure. Um, if the router can be configured to permit two MAC addresses, devices with different MAC addresses will not be able to join the 2.4 gigahertz. However, you can come across someone that if they know the correct MAC address 
or if they get access to the authorized MAC address hardware, they can spoof that on their devices. So just that's that's um, there there are some limitations to MAC address filtering as well. Now 802.11 original authentication method uh, methods. Uh, the best way to secure a wireless network is to use authentication and encryption. The two types that were introduced introduced with the original 802.11 were open system authentication. No password was required. Typically used to provide free internet access in public areas like cafes, airports, and hotels. Very risky to use those. However, they're convenient when you don't want to have to give out passwords. The client is responsible for providing security, such as going through a VPN. In fact, I would... Anytime I'm teaching students or I'm talking with the client, if you're going to connect to anything that's public, Wi-Fi or free, always be using a VPN. Then you do shared key authentication. That provides mechanisms such as WEP, WPA, WPA2, and WPA3 to authenticate and encrypt data between a wireless client and the AP. However, the password must be pre-shared between both parties for them to connect. WEP or wired equivalent privacy, and it's pronounced WEP, and that's what you'll, in industry, you'll hear somebody say WEP. That's the original 802.11. Um, it was based on the Rivest Cypher 4. Um, it's no longer recommended, and it really should never be used, but it is still available, and you will see it on wireless access points, or especially the Soho routers, um, but just never use it. Then we come along with Wi-Fi protected access, the Wi-Fi Alliance standard, um, used WEP, but then secures the data with a much stronger Temporal Key Integrity Protocol, or TKIP. The TKIP changes the key for each packet, making it more difficult to hack. Then you have WPA2, and this is the most common as of the recording of this video, which is the spring of 2022. It uses AES, Advanced Encryption Standard, for encryption. AES is currently considered the strongest encryption protocol. And the next gen that's coming along is WPA3. It's not common yet, but it will be in the next few years. It's the next gen, and all WPA3 enabled devices use the latest security methods. It disallows eight outdated legacy protocols, and it requires the use of protected management frames. Home routers typically have two choices for authentication, WPA and WPA2, and with WPA2 having two authentication in authentication methods. And when you're setting up Soho routers or home routers for clients, you always want to make sure that you're using the WPA. You first you have personal, that's intended for home use or small office networks, and this is the most common that you're going to be using. The user authenticates using a pre-shared key or password. Wireless clients authenticate with the wireless router using a pre-shared password, and no special authentication server is required. And then you have WPA2 Enterprise, and that's where you're going to use a radius server or remote authentication dial-in user service and the device must be authenticated using the radius server and then users must authenticate using 802.1x standard which uses the extensible authentication protocol or EAP for authentication. WPA and WPA2 include two different types of encryption protocols. You have TKIP that's used by WPA and provides support for legacy WLAN equipment. It makes use of WEP but it encrypts the layer 2 payload using TKIP. And then you have an advanced encryption standard, and this is the most common and most chosen. It's used by WPA2, and it uses the counter cipher mode with blockchaining message authentication code protocol, or CCMP. And that does allow for destination hosts to recognize if the encrypted and non-encrypted bits have been altered. With enterprise security mode, it does require an authentication authorization and accounting radius server, or the AAA, and we've talked about that in previous videos. There are pieces of information that are required, the radius server IP address, the UDP port numbers, and the shared key. Now, because WPA2 is starting to become known as not as secure, WPA3 is going to be recommended going forward when it's available. And WPA3 includes four features. You have personal, that thwarts brute force attacks by using simultaneous authentication of equals, or SAE. You have WPA3 Enterprise, that uses the 802.1x EAP authentication. However, that does require use of the 192-bit cryptographic suite and eliminates the mixing of security protocols for previous standards. You also have open networks. That does not use any authentication method. However, it uses opportunistic wireless encryption to encrypt all wireless traffic. So even though you don't need a password to get onto the network, your data is still going to be encrypted. 
And then you have IoT onboarding or Internet of Things onboarding. And with the advance of all of the IoT devices that are coming along, this uses Device Provisioning Protocol or DPP to quickly onboard IoT devices. So what did we learn in this video? Hopefully you learned a lot. This is the only screen we'll have for what did you learn. So you can pause the video here if you want to, and I hope this video was helpful for you.